Back in, KSI Huddle. Let's do it. Questions. You know we roll. Questions stop. We turn it off. Who's first? One of the things that we went through both yesterday and today uh, is like flexibility, flexibility sessions, uh, as well as Carl's presentation, you know, a little bit of the posture analysis. Uh, how does it work if you have somebody who's very flexible um, or beyond what's uh, the average and post posturally they look all right, um, but let's say they have, you know, very flexible hamstrings average quadriceps or vice versa, um, how do you best gauge if they are at risk of injury potential along that lines? Is there a textbook or other resource that you're aware of that would tell you that information? Um, Not right or wrong, just no good. I haven't found one. How's that for you? Okay, yeah. <laughs> so where would you where would you develop that sort of, of awareness from? How would you how would you learn that sort of stuff? Just by doing practicing. Um. Yeah, over about a ten to twenty year period, using um, objective analysis of high volume or high sample sizes and diverse supports, you can come to those conclusions. Or alternatively, you could gain acceleration on that learning process by pursuing mastery in case of coaching program. I don't know anyone else who can teach it, but that's what we do. Mm -hmm. The um, the irony is this: Have you ever heard the word individualization? Yes. What is it? Uh, that the um, whatever service you're providing for an individual is specific just to them. And in, in the context of program design, what does it mean? Uh, the program is. Design taken into account their strengths, limitations. And how do you think, how think the broader industry goes in relation to individualizing training programs? More lip service than truly individualization. Yeah. The greatest extent that I typically see is that they liquid paper out the name in the program and change the name, and everyone gets the same program. And sometimes they even forget to do that. You know, I've been around a while. I, I've never met anyone who can teach individualization and programming. Truly, I mean, I read some books on the subject, but the, the actual application is, is really poorly done. I mean, if it was done well, CrossFit wouldn't exist, so to speak. And I'm not just picking on CrossFit. I'm just giving it as an example. Of this, you know, there's no individualization per se. So the skill is is devoid from the industry. Now, most people when I'm talking about programming, thinking, "Oh, strengthening, strengthening." What of this? Could you individualize an individual flexibility program for a person? Yes. Should you individualize a flexibility program for a person? Definitely. Excellent. Could you do the same for speed? Yes. Endurance? Mm -hmm. Obviously strength? Technical, tactical, psychological? Mm -hmm. Nutrition, recovery? Yes. It's a pretty big job though. I mean, it's not difficult, but... It's a lot of unpaid hours. It's a lot of, lot of competency, a lot of skills, okay. It's not unpaid hours. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> So we have an expectation that that's what the athletes get. So in answer to your question, which is individualized and flexibility broken, like individualize anything else. For coaches, to add. Exactly. It's uh, Rome wasn't built in a day. So you do what needs to be done for that person at that point in time based on your personal experiences. Um, as far as I comment, unpaid hours. A lot of people, we talked about finances just before, a lot of people, and John talked about self-worth, and a lot of people's self-worth is such that they think, I oh, know I'll never pay me for that. I have to write the program at home, and then I go to the gym and teach them, and I'll give you 50 bucks an hour, or whatever it is. And that's not the case. People have low self-worth, therefore, this lack of programming and lack of skill in programming has no um, motivation to desire because they're not going to any for it, they sort of cut it, go and get their money and that's it. Whereas, um, we don't believe in that. The reality is the majority of people are so conditioned to getting a, a program that not pay for the program design, that, that if you start charging the program design, they won't leave you. <laughs> Fantastic. There are people who will value your services if you build that, that reputation. I so so. I was pretty surprised when I came to America for the first time in the 80s that people didn't charge for program design. I thought, oh, what's going on here? Like, I still don't know many people who are in the I'm on the clock, unfortunately. I don't like selling time, but I'm on the clock. You're on the clock. 
and I'll go hard, but you'll pay for every minute we spend together, and every minute I spend working on you, so to speak. Now, I'm a bit more generous than that, but that's the agreement. Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as program design in my spare time. I'll do my professional development in my spare time, and I'll spend all that money. I mean, this is my 50 something trip to North America. How much money do you think I'll spend on international travel just to North America alone? I, I'm not charging the clients directly for that, but ultimately, you know, hope to recoup it all the way. But everything else, specific relation to service and individual aid people. So, in, in an answer to your question, Sean, individualize the flexibility program. But if, if I have answered your question, certainly go with that. I mean, I mean um, and my question is a little bit geared towards uh, how, how to know how much flexibility is enough to make sure. You know, we talked about like left limb versus right limb, making yeah, sure they're right. equal, you know, balanced. Uh, being able to balance out, say, if you have somebody who's already really flexible and you don't notice, you know, just from looking at their posture, any differences. But when you're doing uh, flexibility training with them, you know, it's like, wow, your hamstrings are extremely flexible. How much on their quadriceps to know, or uh, to understand like how f flexible their quadriceps have to be to kind of match the level of flexibility of their hamstrings so it doesn't put the uh, and again, do you think you're going to find that information in, in a textbook? No. So I, again, I don't know anybody can teach that stuff. My, my, uh, one of my pursuits over the last 30 some years is to be able to look at you and watch you over a period of time and say, you're like this, and whoops, that's happened, whoops, that's happened, okay, what's the relationship? And then be able to say, okay, taking that information, I'm going to do this, 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 to change that condition and see whether that prevents that condition moving forward. Okay. So, if I fail in that, then an injury occurs, I've failed. I'll give you an example. I had a look at a, a, a national representative in a, in a, in a South African boy, uh, and you know, we, we were pretty fast, we were under the gun, but he looked pretty good to me, and then four months later he had an ACL, and I was really showed, really showed. No. I have certain theories of how the ACL came, and I believe it was more fatigue related than anything else, because I understand the training ethos that he was in at the time, or in the weeks leading up to his ACL. But nevertheless, I was pretty disappointed. Because I would have liked to help him prevent it. But I, I, I'm expecting more than was perhaps humanly possible, because when an athlete is fatigued, it doesn't really matter what condition they're in. If the fatigue is so high in a contact sport, then, you know, something's going to go wrong. But uh, <clears throat> my goal is to ensure that our coaches can prevent injuries by identifying, okay, this and this need to be changed because if we don't, this is going to happen. So we do have the information, we just don't publish it. All right, thank you. Sure. I have a question on the financial uh, stuff. Uh, what, would, what would you suggest, building assets or paying off debt? What do you think is better? Well, first of all, I'm probably required in West Society to, to, to con confirm that I'm not a, an accountant and I'm not a a licensed um, financial uh, agent, etc., etc. But over and above that, will answer the question. Thank you, sir. <laughs> it, it really depends on some circumstantial situations as well as the market. There was a time in the market when liquidity was high. The, between 1999 and 2003, the financial institutions of the Western world were trying to release as much money in the market as they could. There are, there are financial instruments called low dot payment loans where you could fabricate your income and they give you any money you wanted. And there was a period of time that then forced, uh, there was a lot of inflation in the house prices, or, you know, in other words, the value went up. That was a very good time to not pay off debt and to actually get into more debt. And you could have made a real lot of money in that period of time. Now, obviously, the next phase came and it was a pretty big shock. It was the global financial crisis and whatever you want to call it. it was the, um, the, um, uh, uh, what's, what's the housing one? Can I start with the housing one? What's your housing one called again? The bubble? No, it's something, it'll you know, come back to me. Um, it was brought on by certain things. Anyway, when, when your house. Mortgage backed security? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's indirectly what I'm referring to, but there was one word there. Um, so when, when your market crashed and you, you went through deflation, that was. You needed to be deleveraged at that point. So if you went in with high debt or a, a low, um, a high debt to, to value ratio, then you probably went belly up. 
um, and in the American term, um, you have upside down on your mortgage. And you're forced to, to foreclosures, you know, and all that sort of stuff. Well, I know a lot of people in America who are quite hurt by that. So, what you would need to do is understand the trends in the, in the market to be able to know, okay, this is a time for getting into debt, and this is a time for not being in debt. And if you can time that, you make a lot of money. Because we don't control the, the economic cycles, but we can take advantage of the economic cycles. So uh, that's one of the big, one of the big uh, factors in my answer is that what's, what's the cycle doing? And the other is your financial position. If, if you are uh, decreasing, if you're on a decrease to your age or whatever reason in your capacity, then it's probably not the time. It is a different time to pay in there. So it all depends upon where you are in life. If you're a younger person, I suggest you be more aggressive because if you stuff up, you can go again. If you're near retirement, you probably don't want to take those risks. So there's some general um, quotes, but coaches can talk to you about the, the, the sort of education. There aren't too many uh, coaches in this room who haven't bought uh, real estate on, on one of our guidance. It would be, you know, I think just about every one of them in the room here would have made a purchase. Um, and made a purchase fairly recently, you know, as safely as you can, in, in, in a changing market. So we, we talk about that stuff a lot. So it's a great question, I'm glad you're asking. Because building up our assets is, is a very important part of um, creating the security of financial. We, we're actually in a period now where uh, cash flow probably, the growth of cash flow probably um, is higher than the growth of assets. Generally speaking, when, when, when you don't have a lot of inflation in house prices or other asset vehicles, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're, if you're buying, at the downtime, it's great, but if you're if you're hoping to um, accelerate your wealth through in the short term through holding of those assets, it's probably not going to happen. So uh, this is you know we're still in a period of time where you need to be fairly careful with your um, debt to, to value ratios and really focus on raising your income. If if you got to make sure that um, if you are paying off debt or whatever it happens to be. Um, the like okay, so at this point in time, the, the income that you're generating is, is adding to your lifestyle. If that makes sense, not just taking away from it. Because if you understand, uh, I'm going to maybe flip some people out here, but the currency is a false currency that we have. It's called a fiat currency, F A I T or F I A T, F I A T, which means a false currency. That's the literal interpretation of it. And since Nixon in '72 took us off the gold, took off the gold standards. 71, sorry, um, the, 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 our money is not backed by anything. It's just a, it's a promise. It's just like so the politicians say it's worth this and therefore it is. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if you're trading your time for something that doesn't even exist, it's a really awkward transaction. You know, when maybe when you're in a deathbed or from a soul perspective or from a spiritual perspective, whatever it happens to be, you want to make sure that you're not trading your time, your most limited asset in the world, for something that actually doesn't even exist. And then if you're in in debt for stuff that doesn't make you money, you know, you're, you're, you're going to have a lot of pain in your life. So I just thought I'd just, uh, just open that can of worms too for people who are interested to walk down that path. Uh, and as far as understanding economic cycles, the question is America recovering? Hmm. <coughs> yes, no? I don't think so. Recovery. Yes, no? I would say yes. No. 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 I mean, it's interesting because you learn more by talking to people on the street. So, you know, we've got definite appearances of recovery in some in some areas. I mean, the shale gas sector is uh, putting some strength in the market, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But markets can also be manipulated, and, 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 and media media can report false statistics. So it's more, probably more important to go down the street and ask you know, how the locals feel. I mean, um, and one of the big indicators, I think, in terms of the rate of income relative to the cost of living. And if you've got kids or if you've been around for a while and you, and you find that your salary or whatever your income is not going as far as it used to be, then you know, there's some challenges going on. So, you know, I've got a lot of time for America, I think it's a great country and I love the people. You've got some challenges and we've all got some challenges. I mean, we're all in this together. It's a really simple cycle. Uh, America's the greatest consumers in the world. They were once a superpower. I'm not sure if they are a superpower. I'm moving forward that they are the superpower they once were. But they're the greatest consumers in the world. So when you, you stop spending, you contract. Your supply, which China, contracts. Australia is, is the energy supplier to the, the factories of China. So we contract. It just goes pan around like this. Uh, and, and if you have reduction in immigration, America is potentially shrinking, although it depends where you count. 
elders are, um, that Europe is definitely contracting in terms of population. So there's a lot of factors that drive it, but I, I think we've got some challenges out of this economically speaking. Um, I, probably, I hope that's not the case, but that's certainly the way we look at it. That, you know, we, we make our financial moves relative to what we can think of future, uh, the immediate future holds and long term future. Cool. And that's still part of the KSI education. So yeah. Well, let, 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 let Mike want to talk about it. Right. He was on talking about it. I just gave a, I just gave a talk on it in, in terms of what it's done for me. I had no financial. It, it's just, they don't teach it in school. I didn't I didn't learn it in mid, middle school. I didn't learn it in high school, and I didn't learn it in college, right? And I didn't even learn it in the years following college. How many of you guys actually know how to balance a checkbook? Uh, Wife does. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, but and to, under, to understand and then project, am I going to have enough money for retirement? What's my life going to look like after I put my, my kids through school? Can I afford to put my kids through school? Not relying on government grants and, and loans and that kind of thing. Right? It's getting more expensive. Work in one of the top, or used to work, at one of the top 20 institutions in the United States. $65,000 a year to go to school there. And that's just for your undergraduate. Let's talk about your professional degrees afterwards. How, how am I going to afford that on a physical prep salary? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So there's that challenge. There's the challenge of, of quality of my lifestyle. How much, do I, how much do I want or need to sacrifice lifestyle? My answer is no, I don't want to. So the challenge to me is to become to become more, to have the ability and the skills to generate more. And, and that's what we've done, is that we're taught skills as far as where, where are we now, where do we want to be, so therefore what do we need to do in the meantime? Not wait until the 11th hour and go, oh shit. I do not want to be that, that no offense, I do not want to be that 68-year-old guy working at McDonald's asking if he wants some more fries with that. Because I need, I need to pay the rent for my apartment, not my house anymore, my apartment. Or trying to do box jumps. <laughs> <laughs> but you, do you understand where yeah. I'm going? Yeah, yeah. So, so it's, a, it's, again, it's, it's an incredibly holistic model that we have. It's not offered through any other organization that I know of. Um, and the time, the experience, and the expertise that you get to tap into um, is fantastic. And, and I'm, I'm not just talking about Ian. It's not just about him. It, it's what we've developed as a group because there's other resources that we utilize um, in the concept of holism um, that are far in advance of where we're at, but we get to learn from that. My goal for people is that they, that they are, uh, have a financial position where they can choose who they work with, when they work with, where they work with, if they work with. And that's a great place to be. And when they're young in the industry, they say, no, I don't want to work with any, I just love working with well, that's fantastic. But come back to me four years' time, eight years' time, twelve years' time. And it's just not whether you love what you're doing, it's just whether you realise what you're doing is supporting the quality of life that you want for yourself and your family. Um, you know, if you've got a kid with a, a serious uh, disability, and you have to be faced with it. Can I afford to, to give them the services they need? Your parents who might need financial support, kids might get in some sort of trouble. So, yeah, it's, um, I think it's really important. That's why we teach it. I have a question. Yes, you went over the different levels and you talked about, went through level one through seven. So, how many coaches do you have in your organization that are at a level five, six, or seven? Oh, relatively few. It's like any, it's like any life. You start with the white funnel. Like you might have you know, 100 plus at the top end, right. and then it just goes down like this. So you get attrition at every level. And you get attrition for a lot of reasons. Can we go through that? No, I, I understand. I was just curi curious yeah. why, because I know that Mike has said one of your biggest facilities in yes. Cape Cod, and I would send you on the home base. But well, you look at Mike. Mike has been at this with me for 15 something years. Uh, 15, 16, 17 years. How many people in the world are going to seek mastery for that period of time? It's pretty red train. But the reality is it means he's incredibly confident. And therefore, not only if he's got skills on 75, he'll never be unemployed in his life. Never. But over and above that, all the people he, he touches with, with the quality of the offer. Because what we do, and I don't want to sound 
too arrogant because you know I, I make bold statements and other people misinterpret that. But from my perspective, no one else does what we do and no one else can, can do it. So when someone finds us and values what we do, they're very happy. So I don't know too many people that seek mastery at that level. This is this is not going If I if this was about money from my perspective, I'd offer low shitty content with a high perception of its greatness, and I back it up with incredible marketing to convince you for a while that it's great. And I've just described a lot of people. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? But I'm not going to take a cent off anybody unless they're getting more value than I'm giving them. And, and, and if that statement can't hold true to talk for the next 50 years, then I don't want your money. In fact, I'll give it back to you if that was, you know, if people like to put it out, I don't want you, I don't, I don't want you, I don't want your money. So, it, it, you know, it's your people think, it's a very small program, that's true, because I'm not interested in a McDonald's. Uh, my service for athletes is not a McDonald's service. And it's not a criticism of McDonald's. McDonald's mass market product at a relatively low end cost for people. And that's, you know, that's their choice and the consumer's choice to consume it. When I'm dealing with an elite athlete, do they deserve to be treated with McDonald's food? Not at all. So that's what we do. And it's, 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 a, it's not just an elite service for elite athletes. It might be for high-end high, high end clients of value, but I, mean, I also do a lot of charity work too. And what I call charity work is like, I have a lot of amateur athletes at all levels, sometimes for nothing. So you know, it's, um, we are not uh, about the size of the program. And what's the longest, like uh, we were talking about athletes and their longevity. Yes. And you said the, you know, the better trained, like the better you look, they look after themselves, you've looked after them, the better they've progressed through yes. their career, the longer they last. What's the longest it, time it, athlete, it, after an athlete, or high level? Yeah, yeah, um, uh, probably, 42 uh, at the elite level, and only uh, stopped because they were cut from the program on discrimination of age. So I reckon that athlete could have gone till, you know, possibly even 50. Uh, and that is rare, but uh, if I can get an athlete to 40, mm -hmm. uh, that's really good. Uh, it's, it's rare for a number of reasons, but yeah, we've, we've, uh, I'm really proud of that boy, and you know, he, he, he did a tough one, he got cut, he, you know, he's been there, a lot of depression, etc. You didn't do that to your car. So yeah, you can you can go in your forties at the elite level. And um, if we sat down and analysed all the athletes of of affected, um, you'd see a pretty high number of average Olympic cycles, very high average. So just using um, rugby union alone, uh, the highest, the most capped player in the world of rugby in the history of rugby, I shaped his thinking and his career from a teenager. Of and it'll be a long time for any money exceeds his caps. Uh, and he played for another three or four years in another country after retiring at the national level. Uh, he went through three or four uh, World Cup cycles. Uh, the most capped forward in, in, in Australia.